Kathy is an undergrad, a senior at Harvard College, and I will talk to her about lipid. And so I have a first question, Kathy. Did you ever read The Little Prince from Saint Exupéry? It's a children's book. Yes, I have. Why do you ask? I ask because for those that don't know The Little Prince, it's a book about this prince that is from out of space and land in a desertic region on Earth and meet uh, a pilot and meet also other animals, in particular a fox that has all kind of wise comments. And one of the comments that the fox said in the book is, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And in fact, molecules that are large and small that support a wide range of function and activities within the cell are both the chemical foundation of life, but they also cannot be seen with naked eye. We need powerful instruments or experimental tricks to determine what molecules look like, what their structure are, and to understand their function. So if you consider proteins, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, they are all long polymers made of smaller repeating units with a defined structure. Lipids are different. This class of molecule is not defined by its chemical structure, but by the fact that these molecules share the same property. They are extremely hydrophobic. For that reason, lipids are chemically diverse, but most of them are built by the assembly of few building blocks. So in fact, to go back to the little prince who said uh, to the pilot, draw me a sheep, I will ask you, Kathy, draw me a lipid. All right. Well, here are three representative building blocks of lipids. A fatty acid molecule, a glycerol molecule, and a sphingosine. Glycerol and sphingosine are alcohols that form the backbone of many lipids. And fatty acids form the lipid tails. The fatty acid structure contains a linear hydrocarbon chain and a carboxyl group. The hydrocarbon chain is hydrophobic, while the polar carboxyl group is hydrophilic. So we can focus first on the fatty acids and their properties. So variations in fatty acids come from two sources. First, fatty acid tails can have different lengths. And second, some fatty acids are saturated and others are unsaturated. In a saturated fatty acid, all the carbons from the aliphatic chain are saturated with hydrogen. So only single carbon-carbon bonds are formed, and the hydrocarbon chain is linear. Unsaturated fatty acids have at least one carbon-carbon double bond in their hydrocarbon chain. So the hydrocarbon tail can become bent. These variations mean that different fatty acids have different melting points. Fatty acids interact via weak van der Waals interactions along their hydrocarbon chain. As the number of van der Waals interactions increases, the more energy it takes for the molecules to break free from each other. So, as the number of van der Waals interactions increases, the melting point increases too. Fatty acids with more van der Waals interactions are those with longer tails, so they have more surface to interact, and those with more saturation, so they can pack together more tightly. This is why saturated fatty acids like those in animal fats, are usually solid at room temperature, while unsaturated fatty acids, like those in vegetable oils, are liquid. So I noticed that all the fatty acids that you show us have an even number of carbon. Is it a coincidence? Actually, most, but not all, the fatty acids have an even number of carbons. This property is due to the mechanism of fatty acid synthesis. Now we know all about fatty acids. Tell us how they are incorporated into lipids. So when a lipid is formed, the fatty acid tails react with different backbone molecules to form different types of linkages. The carboxyl groups in fatty acids can react with the hydroxyl groups in glycerol, forming ester linkages. Or they can react with a phosphate group and then link with a hydroxyl group on a glycerol or sphingosine, forming a phosphodiester linkage. A fatty acid carboxyl group can also link to the amino group of a sphingosine forming an amide bond. So cell uses different types of fuel molecules, carbohydrates, sometimes proteins, and a form of lipids called triacylglycerol. As Katie will show you, 
the complicated name actually reflects the structure of the lipid. Right. The name triacylglycerol can be broken up into these parts, tri, acyl, and glycerol. The glycerol in the name represents the fact that the molecule is formed from glycerol, which has three alcohol groups. When a fatty acid carboxyl head reacts with one of these groups, an acyl functional group is formed as part of the new ester linkage. When this happens three times, a triacyl glycerol forms. There are three acyl groups that extend the glycerol backbone with three fatty acid tails when the ester linkages are formed. Here's some structural variation you can have with a triacyl glycerol. A triacyl glycerol can be simple where the three tails are identical. Or, in a mixed triacyl glycerol, the tails are different. The hydrophobic nature of triacyl glycerol molecule has many consequences from the amount of energy they yield by oxidation to the way they are stored within cells. The content of cells is separated from the extracellular environment by membranes formed by structural lipids in which some proteins are embedded. Within a cell, organelles are also limited by lipid-based membranes. The establishment of separate compartments in a cell is essential for cellular functions. Two major types of structural lipids are glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids. Let's see how these structural lipids are assembled. Here is a glycerophospholipid. As you can see in the name, this molecule also has a glycerol backbone. But what makes it different from a triglyceride is the phosphodiester linkage that connects the third carbon in the glycerol to a variable polar or charged group. Since the phosphodiester linkage is the defining characteristic of these molecules, they are also called phosphoglycerides. You can have a lot of variation on the core glycerophospholipid structure. At the glycerol C1, there is usually a 16-carbon or 18-carbon saturated fatty acid. At C2, there is usually an 18-carbon or 20-carbon unsaturated fatty acid. At the glycerol C3, there is a phosphate group. A phosphodiester linkage connects C3 to a variety of head groups. The glycerophospholipid with the simplest head group is known as phosphatidic acid. All other glycerophospholipids are derivatives of this. Now here is a sphingolipid. In this type of lipid, a molecule of sphingosine forms the backbone. One of the hydrophobic tails in a sphingolipid is built in as part of the sphingosine backbone. Another hydrophobic tail is a fatty acid that is linked to the backbone C2 through an amide linkage. The important functional variation in sphingolipids comes from the variable group attached to the backbone C1. I see. So the possible addition of different sugar molecules to carbon-1 on sphingosine creates structural and functional diversity. Is it the only lipid with such diversity? Actually, there is diversity in every class of lipids, resulting from differences in the fatty acid composition of the lipid tails and from variation in the identity of the head group substituents. Membranes are made by the assembly of structural lipids. How does the hydrophobicity determine membrane structure? So structural lipids are amphipathic. Their hydrophilic heads face the aqueous environment, while their hydrophobic tails face each other to form a bilayer. The bilayer closes on itself to form a membrane, like the one that surrounds a cell. The process is thermodynamically favorable, to prevent the hydrophobic edges of the bilayer from being exposed to the environment. But if all lipids have a roughly cylindrical shape, then how does the membrane bend to form a sphere? In fact, some structural lipids, such as phosphatidylcholine, have a cylindrical shape, while other lipids, like phosphatidylethanolamine, have a conical shape because they have a relatively small head group and carry unsaturated fatty acids try to replace in the inner leaflet some of the cylindrical lipids by conical ones. It looks like the conical shape of these lipids is much better adapted to curved membranes. Does this mean that in the cell membrane, the inner and outer leaflets have different compositions? Exactly. We'll discuss the variation in lipid composition of membrane in another video. Well, Kathy, you showed us many great things about lipids. But I think you have to show us another type of lipids that everybody has heard about. This lipid is found in membranes of animal cells, 
and has a structure completely different from the other structural lipids. Yes, this lipid is called cholesterol. As you can see, it is a very flat molecule with four hydrocarbon rings. It is also very hydrophobic, with only a single polar hydroxyl group. Cholesterol shape allows it to intercalate between other structural lipids in the cell membrane. So the stacking of rings against the hydrophobic tails of lipids limits lipids' mobility and affect membrane fluidity. How interesting. It is remarkable that so few building blocks can generate such a diversity of lipids. Do you know that there are about 1,000 different lipid species in any eukaryotic cells? The fact that these cells use 5% of their genes to synthesize lipids shows how important lipids are. In the next videos, we will discuss how some lipids are used to produce energy and how other lipids contribute to membrane formation.